So my name is Dr. Sophie MacArthur, um, and I'm going to be leading the pres presentation this afternoon. So talking about what is it like to work at the University of Buckingham as a clinical educator slash academic teaching fellow. So you might have seen a few variations on the wording, um, but it is essentially the same role. And um, so I've got my colleague Katie here, who if she could, would like to introduce herself and then we'll, we'll start. Hello, my name is Katie, Dr. Katie Kine. I'm a Foundation Year 3 doctor working as clinical educator in Buckingham campus. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. So just a little overview of, of the session. So um, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about who are we at Buckingham University and then particularly who is the medical school what do we do what does this role involve um, the, the the work of the clinical educator and then hopefully some discussion points around what the job might entail and hopefully um, some questions and answers um, at the end of the session so let's move on and um, just just a little bit of background about myself so I'm actually a F ish doctor so SHO tends to do a bit more of the surgical side of things but I've worked um, at the University of Buckingham up in Crewe so we have a satellite campus um, up in Crewe um, for the last kind of 18 months and I love the job it's such a, a great change great co contrast to working within the NHS but I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go through um, so just ha have a think if any questions do pop up throughout the, the presentation if you pop them in the Q&A then I will refer to them at the end. Okay so hopefully this slide should move across. Yeah so first of all just for people who maybe don't know much about the University of Buckingham so it's a little bit different to, to certainly where I trained in Liverpool so it's a non-profit private university so what does this actually mean? There's no uh, funding from the government um, and it's one of the oldest of only five private universities in the UK. So it opened back in 1973. Um, and it's also been lucky enough to receive a royal charter. So good standing university. The thing that makes it quite different as well is that we offer two year courses. Um, obviously that doesn't quite apply for medicine. Medicine will be four and a half of the masters then in three. Um, this is then popular with students, obviously, because it saves them on costs. And um, they can save up to 20% on their course fees. And they, it gets students into the working world a little bit faster. So that's one of the kind of selling points for the university. Um, also really good staff to student ratio. So one student to about 10, um, sorry, 10 students to about one member of staff, um, which is really great because actually you get to know the students quite well. Um, and I personally know all of our students up here on a first name basis. I know a little bit about them and it really helps with that personal relationship that you build with the students. And then thinking actually about the students and the student population, the, the way that Buckingham University is run, um, there's no cap on the amount of international students that they take in their intake. Um, so we've got so much diversity within the student population. And I think there's over 100 nationalities on campus. So it's a really vibrant, cool place to work with lots of different pe uh, pe uh, people with different backgrounds and lots to, to learn. In terms of location, um, so booking, I, I do occasionally go down to, to work in Buckingham, but as I said, I am based mainly in Crewe. Um, but Buckingham, from my experience, I'm sure Katie can, can help me with this, but it's a good, good location in the centre of town, close to Milton Keynes. So you've got your travel links there to, to London. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add, particularly about the location of the campus, Katie? Yeah, so it's um, a really good location near Milton Keynes and we've got a lot of students from London as well. Um, so people travel from London and then come to Buckingham from Milton Keynes to Buckingham is around 20 minutes by car. And um, also, I just want to add, I'm also uh, graduated from Buckingham University, so I'm 2016 um, intake, so I'm an alumni, so it's uh, really interesting to work on the other side. Um, as a student, um, we had a, a quite a small cohort to start with. So I think in our year, it was around 70 or 80 students. So it's really fairly small, more family-like, everyone know everyone. And we had very good student to um, 
educator ratio as well. Perfect, thank you. So just a little bit about Crow. So some of the students, when they, they get offered a place in Crow, they think, gosh, where, where's that? Never never heard of that place before. But actually Crow, so Crow is in Cheshire, um, so north, northwest of England. And actually Crow's got a lot of really good transport links. So the station is, is really close with it, about five, 10 minutes walk from our campus. And you can actually get into London probably in about an hour and a half. Obviously you can get to Manchester, get to Liverpool. So it is actually quite a good, good area to work in. Uh, it used to be Man Met University, but it opened up as a health, um, a health campus back in 2020. Um, so it's, it's a nice location. Obviously great difference between the two different locations. So I'm not sure that the people attending the webinar particularly where you guys are based but either gives it a, a good spread the the job itself there is a chance to travel between campus but it's certainly not something that is expected of the the clinical educator um, so just finished talking about the, the university itself. So there's nine different schools within the university. I won't go through them all, um, but obviously we're going to be talking about the School of Medicine um, today. Um, I love working here, as I've said, everyone's really friendly, works together, that nice kind of community feel, um, close knit, everyone knows each other um, and the students really appreciate that kind of nourishing, nurturing environment, um, a different, completely different environment to, to what I learned when I went to, to medical school. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so here are some a few different pictures um, of the medical school site. And I'm going to talk you through what, what some of the main the models and then the anatomy app that we, we use to teach. So this, the, as I said, the course is four and a half years instead of five. So that means that there's a lot of condensed learning um, for the students and also their holidays tend to be slightly shorter. So we, we benefit really from a nice, very busy timetable, getting involved in lots of different teaching projects. Um, so there's a lot of contact time for the students. They tend to either be in for a morning or an afternoon, so about four or five hour blocks. Um, and in terms of from an academic point of view, what resources do we have to help us teach and what do the students benefit from? So each module that we go through, and I'll, I'll show you some of them um, later on in the PowerPoint, has its own workbook. So there's questions, there's answers for the students to, to work through. So we really do encourage a group work environment for the students. We teach anatomy slightly differently to some, some medical schools. Um, so we actually use models, as you can see in the pictures, so different models to cover all, you know, all the parts of the anatomy system. And then also we use the Complete Anatomy app, and I don't know if anyone's had the opportunity to, to use this app before, but it's, it's really cool. It works really well on an iPad and it, you can get kind of 3D images and work around and click on different areas, zoom in, add layers, take them away, etc., in order to help with that visualisation of the anatomy. Um, plus, also students have access to the to the Royal Society of Medicine for resources, as do we, and then the library services as well. So it's a real privilege to be able to access all these um, resources. Um, Fine, okay, so the, the, the medical school itself, so it opened only back in 2015, so Katie, you were one of the, the very early, <laughs> early ones. Um, so the, the curriculum was then originally based off Leicester, obviously there's been a few different tweaks since then, um, and then the, we got the GMC accreditation in 2019, so that was when the first cohort graduated, so quite, quite a new university, so quite receptive at new ideas, new ways of teaching, new ways of, of learning. Um, if anyone's interested in how the students kind of, how they get into the medical school, it is again slightly different to, to other medical schools. So we don't actually look at the, the UCAT. What we do is, um, so we look at obviously the student ha students have an appropriate A level or equivalent results. And then we have a digital MMI. So they fill in um, stations online. Um, it, they might have to watch a video or, view different uh, different pieces of information and then submit answers digitally and then after that we have a face-to-face -face interview um, much as a lot of the other medical schools do now do so that then different um, stations that the students work through but that is also on teams so it's not actually face-to-face -face. 
Um, but it, it's really good because you get to see a lot of different students and you can see students obviously from all around the world. Um, and as a clinical educator, this is something that we can get involved in, whether it be writing stations or actually, you know, being the interviewer for this. Okay, so next slide is just a little bit of an overview of the, the medical school timetable. So that actually includes all, uh, all years of the course, the five year course overview. So we have phase one, um, so that's the first two years, and then we have phase two. So as a clinical educator, you would focus on the phase one students, so the early years students. Um, so this is kind of, they, they do some clinical work right from the start and they do have placements, but once they're into phase two, they are based out, outside in the hospitals. Um, so the, the hospitals for Buckingham are Milton Keynes, St Andrews, Stoke Mandeville and Warwick and crew we've got Leighton and Macclesfield and we're going to be getting some more local hospitals on board as our students progress through the course. Um, so that's a little bit of an overview of the course and you can see there the, the summary of the different um, components that they work through. Um, so if you focus on the phase one part of the, the course overview, so this is where we come in, where our role is to facilitate teaching. So the, as you can see, an example, um, there's infection, mechanisms of disease, et cetera, reproductive system. So I, I facilitate a few different of, of them modules, um, including as well, you can see um, at the bottom, the Clinical Skills Foundation course, and you can see that runs through all of the terms. And that is where, as a clinician, you kind of come into your own a little bit, because that's the our bread and butter type stuff. So teaching the, the students how to take histories, how to examine. Um, so that that's where we take most of the lead but in the other modules like molecules genes and disease for example you would have a lead lecturer who usually tends to be a scientist they would lead the the lectures and the the planning for the group work throughout their module that usually lasts about 10 weeks um, and our role in that situation would be to facilitate the group work so work with the students um, to potentially we might be doing presentations one week, we might be doing a debate, we might be working through some clinical case studies and our role is to draw out that learning, that information, push them um, to, to be able to widen the learning and then also to give our clinical experience and clinical context to the, the scenario that we're working through. Um, yeah, so let's just move on. Um, so other themes you can see there is there is a, a narrative medicine theme. So I'm not sure about yourself, Katie, but this isn't something I've got as much involved in. But this is where a student takes um, works with a patient with a chronic illness and they follow them up um, throughout you know, the, the, the course of the year, and then they have to do a, a project on that. I don't know if there's anything else, Katie, you've been involved with yeah. that. Yeah, so only as a student um, for narrative medicine, we were given a patient for each um, student. And then um, we meet with this patient regularly. Well, I meet uh, regularly with my patient. And that's really good that we were introduced early patient contact from year one and trying to get to know this patient, build rapport, and then write an essay at the end of the module. So that's something you do along um, along the year, but um, as a clinical educator, you don't really get involved in narrative medicine that much. But as a student, you get given a patient and you follow their journey and um, you get to know them really well. So yeah, that's really good in terms of having that early patient contact. Perfect, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm just looking at the other parts of the table that might not be so clear as to what they are. And the other part is the student selected component. So again, as a clinical, clinical educator, not something we get as involved in, it tends to be led by the lecturers, but as it kind of says on the tin, the student selects a particular area, obviously from a pre-arranged list of, of topic areas. Um, and then they work on this and potentially write essays, do different work with the lecturer on their particular area of interest. So, Katie, again, I'm not sure if you remember what you did for this. 
So I think example of those SSE units are anatomy or public health, where you um, do a poster presentation or anatomy project or, you know, similar like that. Yeah. So it's good uh, again, to an interest. Yeah. yeah, but the clin clinical educators don't really get involved with SSEs either. Not, not a lot. Mainly oh, they're, they're led by unit leads most yeah. of the time. Although I was asked to help out um, last year, the students were creating a pitch for global health um, and there was they had to decide a, resp a humanitarian response to some flood in an area and had to work out funding. So that, that was quite fun, but that was an optional yes. optional thing that I was involved in. So there is opportunity if you if you do have a particular area of interest that you'd like to work on with a, with a lecturer potentially. Um, so then just the last thing on this is how do we actually examine the students? So there's written examinations called ETAs. And then there's OSCE examinations, so that practical side of things, um, and also the ePortfolio system, which simulates very closely what you would see um, for the foundation doctor portfolio. Um, the, the exams are quite clinical from the start, so they're based and they're written as vignettes, so little case um, histories from patients, and then the students will link that to the clinical signs, symptoms, but also certainly in the initial years, that underlying um, physiology or pathophysiology, that scientific background. Okay, so let's move on to what actually is a clinical educator. Um, so what, what do we do? So we're medical doctors, we have a GMC license to practice, um, and we are there to facilitate the, the, the students learning. Um, so there's a few, as I said, it tends to work as lecture, group work lecture. So we might need to be there to facilitate the lecture and facilitate questions and answers during the lecture. That tends to be a smaller part of the job, but the bigger part of the job is working with the students during that group work session that tends to last about two hours and leading a room of students, maybe 20 students, maybe 30 students, and helping them within that particular module that you're assigned to. So there's that aspect. And then obviously there is the clinical skills aspect that I, I mentioned previously. So in another role of a personal tutor, is a personal tutor, sorry. Um, so what we mean by that is this is the bit of the job that I really like personally. So this is where you really get to know um, one group of students or two group of students. They tend to be grouped in, in um, about nine or 10 people per tutor group. Um, so I have now about 18 students because I've got two. Um, and I would meet with these students as a group or individually throughout the year and discuss any um, issues they might have, whether it be pastorally, whether it be academically. I would go through and discuss areas of improvement and techniques for studying, for exams. So it's a really nice role um, that helps you really get involved with, with the students. Um, other aspects of the role include things like developing course materials. So what do I actually mean by that? So things like helping to give a clinical context for exam questions, for OSCE stations, for interview stations. So when, when I've been writing interview stations recently, I think, how can we um, pick up the students that actually are going to be the doctors who we're going to work with and we're going to supervise in future practice. So really thinking about how we contribute to, to the profession by developing these new, you know, the doctors of tomorrow. So there's, there's, there's that side of things. So the developing course materials, that also includes making revision sessions. You won't be expected to make new material from scratch that's on the basic curriculum, that would be from the lecturers. However, they might ask you for help. They might ask you to go through things. If you're interested, you can give lectures as well, but that's, you don't have to. Um, and then the other thing to, to, to consider is the opportunity to complete the PG cert in medical education. And um, I have got a whole slide on that later on, so I'll discuss that in a little bit more detail later. But what's really good about the, the PG cert in medical education is you're learning them underpinning concepts to what you're then doing in practice. And then it helps you to, to improve on your practice as well. OK, perfect. I'll move on there then. So what does a typical week look like? So 
The first thing you might notice there is none of us, baby bar one, work full time here. We're not really expected to work full time in this role because um, we're expected to, to mix it with clinical work, whether that be locum or, or whatever, to keep that, um, to keep your skills up, you know, in the hospital or in the GP practice um, whilst you're doing this job. So this is an example of, of a week. Usually people work um, at 0.6, so that's that three days, but uh, you can do a 0.8, you can do a 0.4, you can do a sessional, so you might just do one day a week for a shorter contract. It's very, very flexible, and the university is quite interested in getting different people with different backgrounds, and when I say, I say that, I mean registered doctors, whether they be um, SHO doctors, whether they be GPs, whether they be consultants, um, so here's a little example of, of a typical week. Um, so you would be expected to work from half eight till half five with an hour's lunch in the middle at some point. Um, the, the first kind of half hour is just, it's not like walking into an NHS handover where you've got 10 patients to see. You actually, I can see Katie laughing. It, it's, um, it's a little bit more relaxed. So I don't know how it's for you guys in Buckingham, but we might get a cup of tea, have a little chat, think about how we're gonna set up the day. Sometimes we've got to go and set up the, the lecture theatre, which takes a little, a little longer, um, but usually it's a, quite a nice start into the day. And then, so for the example, if we look at the, the Wednesday there, so that's that CSFC, so clinical skills um, that we're teaching them. So we work with the students then in small groups. There's not a lecture for, for this type of session. And for an example here, we might be teaching a respiratory exam. So what we would have expected the students to have uh, had a look at a respiratory exam, watch some videos online, look at the preparation, and then we might demonstrate with them and go through it and get them to practice. So it's, it's almost like your simple bedside teaching, that nice and easy stuff we know, linking it maybe what you might have seen recently in clinical practice, interesting signs you might have seen, etc. And then in the afternoon, so the, the HADSOC, so that's Health and Disease in Society, that's actually on at the moment. Um, so thinking about public health aspects, epidemiology, global health. So for example, the students right now, um, after they've finished the lecture, they are doing um, a pitch to do with public health. Um, and what we'll do is we'll give them some time to prepare and then they will deliver and we'll be expected to judge um, what, what they're doing and give them some good feedback. Um, Thursday, again, similar thing, but this Thursday would be tissues of the body. Um, so this is your histology type um, teaching. And this week, for example, it might be cartilage and bones. So you might be looking at some different histology slides with the students. It tends to be online, so we have huge big whiteboards um, that are interactive and we would zoom in images, show them different things, use different resources. There might be a, a quiz, um, information on Moodle, clinical cases, lots of different ways of learning. And then in the afternoon of that day, you don't have a session, but what you would do is spend time preparing for maybe the Friday session or what, what you're planning on next week. Um, in your preparation time, you might do other things as well. So the main thing is to prepare for, you, for you, the sessions that are upcoming, but you might have meetings potentially with your tutees. Um, you might be working on ETA questions, developing some written exam questions. You might need to catch up with colleagues for other meetings. Um, so that, that's an example there. And then the same thing potentially on the Friday morning and then the Friday afternoon, so it will be metabolism. So this is your basic um, structure and thinking about carbohydrate metabolism, protein metabolism, breakdown of glucose, Krebs cycle, all the stuff that a lot of us tend to hit and we get a bit of a refresher and we work an hour, hour role there is to obviously work through with the students but then try and give that a little bit of clinical context because metabolism particularly is one of the harder subjects so you when you are doing this job you do need to refer back to what you maybe did in first and second year uh, of uni yourself but obviously you would use the resources given by the lecturer any reading around and discussing with your colleagues and things like that have you got anything to add there katie 
Yeah, so I'll just talk through my typical week. So I do three days of teaching in Buckingham here. So Monday to Wednesday, and then I work as a locum SHO on Thursday, Fridays in either um, Milton Keynes Hospital, or I also uh, join locum agency and I work in Genesis Care, which is a cancer, private cancer care unit as a SHO. So my three days of teaching, so I teach all day on Monday, and then on Tuesday morning, I have a prep time. In those times, I would either prepare for uh, my afternoon or next week sessions, or I could fit in my personal tutor meetings. Um, so I'll do tutor meetings. Sometimes we'll have some uh, marking to do. So those are the time that we fit in exam markings and um lecture uh, prepping as well and for my other Thursday and Friday I try to do some clinical work so you, I got a nice mix, mixture of teaching and also clinical work so it's, it works out quite well and then over the weekend I've got enough time to do some exam preparation so I'm applying for IMT so I, um, I'm also uh, revising for MRCP as well so it gives me that flexibility to um, study for exam and have uh, my own time as well so yeah that's my typical week. Wow thank you so overall it's it's nice it's a nice week there's no on calls there's no having to to stay late um, it's nice and flexible so for example if if there was a reason and you needed to work from home, potentially on your prep session on the Thursday afternoon or the Friday morning, as long as the, the line manager's aware and is happy with that, there is some opportunity for flexible working. Obviously, when it's teaching, it is all face-to-face, -face, so there's nothing really that happens online apart from revision sessions. And um, So you would be expected to be in every day, but when you have got prep, sometimes there's a little bit more flexibility if for any reason you needed to do that at home. And in terms of the technology that we use, so I'm just doing this presentation now from my own laptop, we, um, we get given iPads, which helps to us to, to look at the work that the students uh, are given. Um, but most of the work we do is on Microsoft Teams and then on the University Moodle page. Um, so it's quite easy in terms of, of technology to, if you need to take that home or take it to a different location, then that's quite easy it's not again maybe like working in the NHS it does hopefully we you know there's a lot of cross-campus communication we have lectures that are streamed to both campuses and um, so it does work quite well and you get quite up on the technology quite quickly okay so let's just move on to talk about the PG cert in medical education so this um, is a part-time course it's master's level I think it's about a third towards the, the full master's um, it's very flexible, so there are um, certain points where you will meet up with the facilitator, you'll meet up with your colleagues and talk through the different concepts that you might have been reading about, um, but it is flexible, so on one of them, them days off when you potentially weren't doing a, a locum shift or, or however, um, you would spend that doing the, the PG cert in medical education. If that's something that you would like to do, you don't have to do it, but it is funded um, as long as you're here um, for at least a year is my understanding but the finer details in in the description of the jobs um, so as part of the PG so unfortunately um, Dr Megan Brown who leads the the PG said she wasn't able to talk to us today so I'm going to talk to it from from my rough memory and then Katie can hopefully help me, me a little bit because she's done it more recently than me um, but my understanding was we we did a core module so to get them basic principles under our belts and um, it's a lot of writing a lot of reading a lot of reflecting feedback from colleagues feedback from students so there is that practice practical element to it and you do apply and it fits in well with the job and then after you've done the car module you do one of the option modules and um, so approaches to clinical teaching and effective supervision 
or learning the clinical team simulation of work-based learning. So I did the first one about effective supervision. So I focus a lot of my work about thinking about my tutor group and how I uh, worked with them, what, what type of supervision worked well, what could I improve on, that type of thing. Um, so then once you've done the, the PG set, so that's, that would last more or less the year, but it, there is quite long breaks for the terms in between. Um, so then you get the accreditation from the Advanced Higher Education and the Academy of Medical Educators. So there's a few letters there you can put after your name if you so fancy. Um, and it's good. It's, it's based, as I said, it's based online. Lots of different ways of learning, lots of reading, but also working with different colleagues um, and, and lots of kind of discussion elements. And it's assessed by essays and, and reflective writing. So it's actually quite a different way to learn and be educated compared to doing a medical degree, where it's kind of that coursework component. So it's quite interesting to see how you adapt to doing that because there is a hard deadline long down the line, but how do you plan and manage your time before that? So I don't know if Katie, if you want to add anything in there. Yes, yeah, so I'm an enrolled to PG cert at the moment from August. So I'm doing August to December. I've just finished my core module actually. So that's uh, August to December. Then I've got a nice long break from December to February. So I've just now started my second module, which is on um, simulation. So I chose the second bit. Um, yeah, it's it's been really good. So it's give the it's all, all online. So it gives that flexibility that I could catch up over the weekend. Um, or I could um, do it in my own time. So it, there's no set. Um, lecture times that you need to attend there's also optional drop-in time and optional um learning uh, uh, like tutor time which you can sign up for it but you don't have to um the in terms of the assessment after each module so for my core module i have to do 1500 essay on teaching observation report where you teach to a student what you plan the session you teach the student and someone um, observe you and give you the written feedback and then you write on that and then the another essay is 3500 words essay on your reflective narrative which is the general uh, view on your teaching journey and then um, now that I've signed up for the simulation I'll do the same 1500 essay uh, and 3500 essay at the end of my simulation module as well. So it's a perfect good opportunity for F3 like me. So it's um, just give more point on my portfolio. And also I thought um, I really enjoy teaching during my foundation year. So, um, but I didn't really have um, enough knowledge on educational theories and things. So this really solidify the knowledge on teaching, which helps with giving feedback to my students when I'm teaching them. Great. Thank you. I think just another thing to add in as well is because you will be doing this with the other clinical educators who've just started, it's quite good. You know, you can help each other, you can work together. There's lots of academics who've also done the exact same course. So very happy to observe you, give you feedback and, and give pointers and help. So it's quite a nice, although it is online, sometimes you might feel like you know, a bit isolated. It's not because people all at work are, are often doing the same thing in a similar stage. Um, so that's really good. I have put a little QR code on the PowerPoint there that hopefully if you scan that should take you through um, to, to the page where the university advertises it. But as I said, obviously there is a price on there, but as long as you qualify in terms of your commitment to being a clinical educator and days worked and, and time worked, then this would be, would be funded as well. So it's a great additional thing. Okay, so thinking about the, the job, what experience do you need? In terms of teaching, not that much. Um, what, what we're looking for, so I do interview um, other clinical educators. What we're looking for is just someone who's passionate, who's keen to learn, is happy to, to learn um, you know, through experience, wants to take part in the PG cert. So we don't need any formal 
educational background um, in order to apply for the job. It'll, co it'll come with the experience when you actually get into it. But obviously, if you have got some background in teaching, that's that's great. Um, you do, do need a license to practice. So you'd need your, your full GMC license and a right to work in the UK. And um, I know there's a bit of confusion previously about um, do we sponsor um, for visas, but the, the answer from the university, unfortunately, is no. Um, but basically, we're just, we're, you know, as a team, it's a really friendly team. Everybody gets on, on really well. Um, and it is, it is slightly different to working clinically in terms of how you work together because we have a lot of longitudinal projects. So different things where you'll meet with different colleagues and you'll be working on different projects um, over a longer period of time. So it's really nice to learn them other skills. And again, time management skills in another sense, not just how to prioritize your patients on an on call but thinking how am I going to plan my week how am I going to plan my month how am I going to fit this webinar in when I know I've got had to teach this afternoon things things like that um but the, you know, so it we just it's nice to work with people who are enthusiastic and happy to help and happy to get involved and work together essentially um so we're nearly at the end of the PowerPoint, just a couple more things to pick up on. Um, so what other opportunities are there? So I've mentioned this, this role is perfect for someone really kind of F3 level who's done the first couple of years in hospital, looking for a bit of a change, and then potentially wants to go into specialist training at another point. However, actually within the university, there is a chance to progress if you want to stay in this role. Um, so some new roles that have came out is deputy unit lead. So we've said that the lecturer is the, the unit lead. So for example, let's say HADSOC, so it's the public health module. So we've got the, the, the lecturer who's the unit lead, but what we then look for on the other side, so if that lecturer is based at Buckingham or at Crew, we want a deputy unit lead. Doesn't have to be a scientist, can be a clinician, either, either or, and they would then support that, that um, lecture in, in more depth and deliver some of the lectures in that role and help more with the course content. And um, we also have the senior academic teaching fellow, so that's kind of the the line manager um, of the the clinical educator. So that's another chance of progression and being able to practice and learn that that more of the managerial type skill. Um, and then finally, there is lecturer posts. As I said, our lecturers do tend to be scientists, but it doesn't matter. We've got clinicians as well who are fantastic lecturers. Um, and again, we all work together to so say if we have a clinician who is a lecturer, occasionally they might bring the scientist their scientist colleague in to do maybe histology or specific part of the module that maybe they feel like they're not best placed for. And it works the other way around as well. The scientists bring in the clinicians um, if there's parts of their module that they think would benefit from that clinical input. So there is definitely um, opportunity to, to work up the ladder in education if that's what you're interested in, um, but also obviously alongside then the, the clinical work. And um, so that brings us to the end of the, the more didactic part, the, the PowerPoint part. So that leads us on really to questions and um, discussions. Um, so I was wondering, I do have some questions prepared, um, but I'm wondering if anyone's popped any questions in the q and I I can't see anything come through yet. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pop on, um, Okay, <laughs> good question. So where can we apply? What I, my last slide is here. So I'll, I'll, I'll kind of go backwards. So <laughs> this is my, my last slide. So where can I find out more job information? So for Buckingham, if you contact uh, Dr. Louise, Louise Rogers and for Crew, if you contact Dr. Ian Kay, um, again, the, there is QR codes that should take you to the job adverts. Um, and hopefully I did check them the other night, hopefully they still work. So that should answer that question. Um, just if I go back, just bear with me. Um, there was, I did think of a couple of questions that some of my colleagues who recently started have asked. So the, the turnover of clinical educators does tend to be quite quick because people do tend to stay for a year, do the PG cert and then move on more to specialist training. Um, so we do have a lot of new starters quite often. 
Okay, so is there support available for your own knowledge in areas you feel less confident? Yeah, histology, absolutely. Um, I don't know if, Katie, if you want to come in on this one with me. Yeah, I, I don't do um, histology, but I do um, membranes and receptors. So again, being in clinical for, you know, past two years, back to that basic clinical knowledge. So you do have to prepare quite a lot. But yeah. you you will be given an answer uh, before the group work, so you can prepare for it. It's not um, you don't have to do your own research and stuff. So you, you'll have a facilitator workbook, and you can also ask the unit lead and um, to clarify things if you don't, um, if you need to. Yeah. So so uh, as I said previously, it's a very supportive in, environment, and the lecturer is definitely approachable to answer uh, um, questions specific to their area of interest and um, so quite often our kind of resident uh, histology expert is Dr Roberts um, up, up in crew with us and quite often will push histology his way to help and actually the other week uh, he um, attended the group work session so we actually beamed him into all the screens in all the rooms we worked through some of the histology with the students obviously with our answers there with the extra little bit of reading around the subject we might have done but then he then to everyone went through the answers with them and helped to describe it so it's, it's okay as well to not know something or not fully understand something because the lecturer is always there to, to help um, and the, the students are quite receptive to okay let's look this up together how should we look this up what do you think is the answer so that's all part of that uh, facilitation role you don't need to know everything off the top of your head because we are there as the clinical educator not as the specialist in that particular area so we give a broad overview and helping the students to develop their their learning skills um shall i we've someone's missed the slide i'll put that up at the end so so we could you can see that again um, I was just thinking of, of a couple of other questions that people have previously asked. So we've kind of covered um, what to do if a student's asked me a question I don't know the answer. That's fine. Work through it with them um, and ask this, the lecturer if needed. You might you will have had a chance to prepare and discuss with your colleagues so you can often foresee what you know is going to be a difficult um, concept to, to understand. I use all sorts of different media when I'm teaching the students, so sometimes I'll get a video up on the board, sometimes I'll use the whiteboard and draw diagrams, show different pictures, um, but this, what part of our role as well is to teach the students to become adult learners and to become self-sufficient, um, so actually you'd be surprised so quite often if you give them the tools to work it out, they will then be able to work out themselves. Um, Another thing, so how to, how to deal with difficult students. I don't know, Katie, have you got any particular experience? I've had a few, <laughs> a few difficult students. Yeah, um, how do you deal with it, Sophie? <laughs> so, so it depends. So when you, when you do the PG cert, you learn about, yeah. is this um, a, a learner in difficulty or just a mm. difficult learner which way around is it is it actually that the student's struggling and needs some extra help so when it when you think about the personal tutor role and that pastoral role I sometimes I've had students my, my, my the best students the ones who are really good and really interactive and they'll be sat there and they'll look really upset and really miserable and I think that's not what they're like usually and then a couple of times I've had to, you know, work to the end of the session and I've brought the student to the side and I've said, you know, you don't look very happy, is everything okay? And then suddenly the floodgates open and they tell me everything that's happened. So if you build that nice rapport with students, often you can tell if the, if the group dynamics off, if something's going on and students actually feel, because we're kind of that near peer, we're not that far ahead of them, we can have that bit more of an open discussion. So I've had that quite a few times with different students coming to me with problems and that's that's fine. Um, sometimes just venting that frustration, they'll, they'll talk to you and then they'll feel better about it. Or you might need to escalate it. So if there's pastoral issues, we've got student support team, we've got faculty mentor, we've got counsellors, there's all sorts of people who you would be, you would 
um, you would be trained about how, you know, how to access these people, how to sign course to students, but obviously you don't take the role of the doctor in any sense. Um, you need to just sign course to the appropriate people people so quite often I've signed course of students to their own GP and make sure that they're signed up and things like that so that's difficult students in the ter in terms of maybe pastoral issues but sometimes you might just get students who are actually a bit cheeky a bit self-entitled and how, yeah. how do you deal with that um and you've got to have that um kind of discipline and authority and that can sometimes become a little bit difficult because as I've said as being a near peer they sometimes look at us almost too much as a as a friend as a colleague when actually we are there we are there to teach and to hold that authority so the thing we've been struggling with with the new students at crew at the moment is the noise levels is so many people having big personalities speaking not letting other people speak in the room and and that can be quite a difficult aspect of the job how do you control that uh, room of students and sometimes you do have to get a bit of your, your teacher voice on I don't know if you've had a similar similar problem before yeah so I had um, a group of students last uh, week where I um, give them a break for 10 minutes and I said can you be back by 10 minutes and then they got back at 20 minutes so I had a talk with them about being professional and you know um, respecting the time and then at the same time they were they looked quite uninterested during the group work so um what I uh, did was I just sit down with them like why are you not interested um, and they well, some of them just want to know about exams like is this going to be an exams like this is not your A level or GCSE anymore so you you need to know um not just about exam you're likely to see these in your clinical work when you become a doctor as well so it's just trying to make them understand but then they are only 18 19 so um yeah they're they're quite young so yeah <laughs> There is a mix, so that's one thing we didn't mention, actually, yeah. there's a mix of students. Um, we can have anyone from like 18, 19, or we do have grads as well, and actually some sometimes grads, that yeah. a bit of conflict. Mm. Um, some of them struggle then with that group working attitude. Um, but yeah, interesting point. I'll move on. We've had another question come through. So when are the interviews for the position held and are these online? So um, interviews are held as and when there's not a specific point because we, we do recruit all year the big recruit is now for the August start um, and in terms of online or face-to-face -face, I know certainly at crew um, it's it can be the, the person's preference I would recommend to come in face-to-face -face because you want to come and have a look see what the department's like see what people um see what your colleagues are going to be like and then do the interview face to face but as far as I'm aware there is the opportunity to do that um, online but when I put back I'll put the the last slide on towards the end of the Q&A and um, if you follow through the advert and look up the email addresses of the line managers to contact they'll be able to help you with anything specific like that as well to, to answer um, we'll do another couple of questions and then we'll, we'll close the the session there um, so Okay, then um, let's just skip the next one. But how will I balance um, clinical PG cert and teaching? Um, obviously, I've finished my PG cert now, so because I've been here for 18 months. At the time, it, it was a little bit difficult, but you've just got to be organised with, with your time. Um, with the PG cert as well, it can be a little bit of a domino effect. It's quite easy to, okay, I'll do week one in week two, then two and three, and then it, you get further and further behind. So you've just got to be organised and plan your time effectively. Personally, I would recommend doing one day for PG cert, one day for clinical, and then your three days teaching but I don't know what what do you think Katie I don't know how you balance it there so yeah I'm I'm guilty of leaving um a week one week two and then I started panic in like week 10 um because 
thing for PG said you're supposed to post forum post every week and then that could be a very good resource for your essay at the end so now I'm doing it weekly for my all the forum posts I've learned my lesson but um so how I'm doing is so three days teaching a uh, two-day clinical work and over the weekend I do my PG set and uh, my revision for MRCP. Perfect. So it's nice to go. It's nice work life balance as well. Yes. You know, you, you don't have to do evenings, weekends if, if you don't choose. Um, yeah. have. Um, and so can you put your learning into practice with PG, sir? I think definitely you, you, you can, can't you? It certainly links um, very well together and there is an overlap which actually potentially sometimes saves a little bit on the, the PG cert work so one of my colleagues at the moment she chose to deliver it was a radiology lecture um, and she chose to deliver that which is, is great but then she can also then use it for a PG cert and she got some feedback from students so there's the things certainly link together it might it would actually be a little bit difficult I think to do the PG cert without being in some sort of clinical role I think you would get so much from from being able to do bedside teaching but I certainly think that the job does lend itself and go quite nicely um yeah and then the, the last one that we we put there was flex, flex option for flexible working in a sense yes you've just got to have that open and honest relationship with your line manager if you need to work from home some of the time it's fine and obviously the days that you work whether it be three days four days two days are negotiable depending on what the needs of the university are or whether it's what we call a sessional so that's almost like a locum where there might just be occasional days it might be an afternoon it might be in morning where you would come and join the session um Fine. Okay. I'll just put that. Um, that's the, the job information back on the screen there. So hopefully anyone who missed that can find it. And I think Anastasia's put a few things in the chat to remind us to look at the social media pages. And you can also see the different vacancies on there if there's anything slightly different to the QR codes that I've attached. Um, I'm just checking there's no other questions I think we've worked through all the questions there unless anybody wants to put a last thing in now is there anything else Katie that you thought we should add to the session I can no I think <laughs> I think it was really good great well, hopefully that's um informative um more than happy as well actually i'll include my email address in the chat if there was anything in particular that you wanted to ask me but certainly the line managers emails that are included should be um should be helpful enough um but thank you everyone for for listening and i hope it was helpful and gave you a little bit of an insight because i know certainly when i started the role i thought what is this what what am i going to be doing and actually i was yeah. really pleasantly surprised hence why i've um, stayed for so long um but i think that concludes the the session there then thank you for listening yeah thank you very much guys hope you apply for this job thank you very much